thank you, Olivia. Uh, thank you all. Uh, it's my very great pleasure to be here. It's my first time in Abu Dhabi, uh, first time at, at NYU Abu Dhabi. So uh, I'm very excited to, uh, to be with you and to uh, share with you some work that I've done over, as you'll see from the dates, quite a long period of time. Um, I've kind of started with this title, Are We the Same or Different? And of course, like most titles of the sort, the answer is both. Um, we are the same as each other, yet we get very, uh, 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 or we pay a lot of attention to the superficial differences among us. And there's a lot in that, that my colleagues in social psychology and clinical psychology uh, and uh, developmental psychology uh, have done a lot of work on, a lot of important work and a lot of important questions uh, for us you know, in this uh, complicated world that we live in. Um, my interest as a perceptual psychologist and a cognitive psychologist uh, is really in the fundamental underpinning. So um, before we figure out whether that person is in my group and whether I behave in certain ways uh, towards him or her because of that, because I think that they're kind of an ally of mine or they're not uh, an ally of mine, maybe someone that I want to uh, be uh, uh, in a group with or someone that I want to ostracize away from, before all that, uh, I have to make decisions about that person. And it kind of turns out that even in our early perceptual processing, we engage in a lot of uh, um, uh, processes that lead us to, lead us down this line where we end up in this uh, complicated and often uh, uh, unhappy social world uh, that, that we find ourselves in. So I think understanding these questions of how it is that we divide the world up into uh, those who are similar to us and those who are different from us, uh, can, uh, these are important questions that we need to understand for this kind of uh, uh, understanding the complex social world uh, that we live in. Now, before then I talk about faces, um, because as Olivia said, I'm originally from New Zealand, uh, I'm mandated, it's in my national passport, I have to start every talk with a picture of sheep, uh, our national animal, uh, apart from the, from the kiwi bird. So here uh, is a beautiful New Zealand scene, and as a perceptual psychologist, one of the things that fascinates me is that this is a, a relatively impoverished visual stimulus, just a whole bunch of pixels on the screen, yet you can use your cognitive machinery to draw uh, almost an infinite number of conclusions about the scene. You can focus on the individual components, you can focus, focus on the animals, the sheep, you can focus on the beautiful, um, I think my point is, working. Maybe I'm, is that? Yeah, do the best. Oops. Okay, well, that's fine. So you can focus on the sheep, you can focus on the beautiful clear water, you can focus on the lovely clouds, uh, the, the, the uh, very clean air uh, that we have in New Zealand, all the good reasons that you should visit uh, my native country. Um, but also you can do much more general conclusions like if I ask you, is this an outdoor scene? You can say, yes, uh, it is. Um, and then if I show you uh, my current home, uh, where I live, right, this image is almost completely different. Uh, it's much darker. Um, okay, try this one. Um, it's much darker. Uh, there's kind of bright lights uh, 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 throughout. But, oh. <laughs> Okay, no, I'll just, I'll just press the keys. Okay. Sorry for the technical difficulty. So uh, the, the image itself is almost completely different to the first one, yet if I ask you, is this also an outdoor scene, you can say easily that it is, right? So your conclusion seems to go way beyond the individual data. If you're gonna categorize these as being similar or different, on the basis of the data, you'd say they're very different, yet, you can say that they're in the same superordinate category. And you can do the same thing with this picture, 
which, in which I asked my daughter, can you draw me an, an outdoor scene? And this is what she drew. You have never witnessed in your life, uh, it, like in your real life, outdoors, a scene like this, yet you can easily tell me, yes, that this is also an outdoor scene. So what these are showing us is that our brain is very capable of going beyond the immediate data uh, using both uh, knowledge that it's acquired over time, using all, also its biological endowment to draw conclusions about uh, visual stimuli. Now, this is not a talk on visual illusions. This is a face talk, but uh, just to, you know, visual illusions are a nice way to demonstrate how our brain goes beyond the immediate data. So this is a classic example from uh, Roger Shepard showing the big monster chasing the little monster, uh, except, of course, that the two monsters are the same size. So there's the little one. But if we go back, we find that actually it's the same size as the big one, right? So it's uh, the same physical size in the image, yet as our brain interprets the scene, we interpret that the two monsters are quite different because in the real world they would be, right? So our brain goes beyond the immediate data in the image to draw a conclusion based upon uh, our knowledge of the scene. Similarly, in terms of brightness, this is a famous one from Ted Adelson, where we have a checkerboard with a cylinder casting a shadow across the board. We have light squares and dark squares, but of course, in the shadow, the light squares are a little bit darker because of the shadow, so we can see square B is a little bit darker than this one here, right, because of the shadow. The question is, what's the difference in lightness between A and B, right? So still it looks like A is very dark and B is relatively light, okay? That's the interpretation that your brain is drawing based on your knowledge of the world. The actual answer in terms of the image is that A and B are exactly the same, right? So they are exactly the same brightness. There's no difference between them. Unless you've seen this, you don't believe me. So there's a, uh, a uniform gray bar that's miraculously appeared there, and I will drag it between the squares. And you will see that in that uniform gray bar is the same as A and is also the same as B, right? Because it disappears into both of them. So actually, A and B are exactly the same brightness, but it appears to you that they're different. And the reason it appears to you is because if this was in the real world, which is what your brain wants to draw conclusions about, then A would be darker than B because B is dark because of the cast shadow, right? So your brain is, is taking all that information in as it interprets the scene. So your brain's doing a good job of interpreting the scene, but turns out that's not what's in the actual data uh, of the stimulus. So these are all examples how our brain goes well beyond the data. And what we'll see is the same in face perception, right? So here's a face. Uh, when you see this stimulus, right, you often have some kind of reaction that goes beyond just this as a simple stimulus, right? It's kind of a ridiculous expression. Most of you probably know who Mr. Bean is. You are simultaneously kind of amused and annoyed and frustrated because he's that kind of character. You may know the actor Rowan Atkinson who's been in lots of other things like Blackadder, which is also very funny, right? So, so the, your instantaneous reaction to the image goes a long way beyond just the precise um, uh, stimulus there. And so my interest is in uh, aspects of face perception that go beyond the immediate image, uh, more towards our interpretation of the image. And the two things I'll talk about in the talk are that associated with uh, ethnicity, how we perceive people, people's identities, and whether we're better at doing that for faces that are more similar to us uh, than faces that are from different ethnicities. And then also how we draw ju judgments about people's personalities and how that influences us in conclusions that we make about them. So the overview of the talk, I'll just talk a little bit about how we perceive faces uh, in general, and then I'll talk about questions of face ethnicities. Do other people look the same? Um, and the answer, of course, individuals vary, so this is not true for everyone, but many people will say that people of another ethnicity do appear to look the same, but it's people of different ethnicities will say that about each other, so we'll have a look at that. And then towards the end, we'll look at uh, whether 
people make judgments of personality based on face and then what implications that has uh, for uh, questions that they draw. Okay, so first of all, perceiving faces. So I have two children, so I couldn't have just a picture from my daughter, so here's a picture of my son, who's a cartoonist, and so I just said to him, draw as many faces for me as you can, and he got up to like in the 50s, and then he ran out of, pa out of paper. Um, so again, you can see with just like a circle and a couple of ears and some very simple facial expressions, you get all sorts of quite sophisticated changes in emotion, and you can read into these different characters you know, whether they're good characters or bad characters or malevolent or happy or, or whatever. Um, here's another task for you, right, to see how good your face perception skills are. This is my school picture from when I was 12 years old, okay? Now, most of you have only just met me here for the first time. Can you figure out who I am in that picture? That one. That's me. Okay. Who was like, who, who got somewhere close to that? Okay, a few. Okay. Many, many not. Okay. So now, interestingly, literally yesterday on Facebook, my high school buddy posted this picture so that I'll, I'll better show this one too. So this is uh, five years later. Okay, now I'm 17. Can you figure out who 17 year old Will is? Yes, correct. Okay, so now that tells us also something about the changes in the face through adolescence, right? I am more physically similar to this version than to the 12-year-old version. But well done for that one. Um, so, so let's use that one. This was, you, you did better as a participant group. Um, again, that's pretty amazing, right? So like I say, that was when I was 17. Um, I'm slightly older than 17 now, so that was quite a long time ago. And yet you were pretty easily able uh, many of you, to do that verification from a bunch of uh, pretty similar looking, you know, individuals. So, um, so your ability to discriminate these faces is quite impressive uh, in, in that uh, regard. Now, um, faces are generally easier to identify right way up, but upside down, you can still do some recognition. You probably identify this individual who, let's see, it's Tuesday. I think she's still the prime minister. I'm not quite sure. Um, you might notice there's something a little different about the faces, right? If you look carefully, maybe the mouths look a little different and the eyes. Some of you will know what's coming. So if I turn them up the right way around, you will notice maybe a little more easily. <laughs> this is the famous Thatcherization effect, um, so-called because the first paper that reported this did it with a picture of Margaret Thatcher. Turns out it works for any prime minister. Um, so if you invert the eyes and the mouth of a face, it makes it look grotesque. However, you're only sensitive to that grotesqueness in the upright face, right? So when the face is inverted, it's, it's first of all, you, you lose the grotesqueness completely and it becomes quite difficult to detect the changes to the face. So there's something completely lost to your sensitivity in the inverted face than the upright face. So this tells us that it seems like where we specialize for upright face perception. We're quite good at face perception as you were in identifying me in my high school class photo, but it only seems to work for upright faces. It doesn't work so well for faces of different orientations. And in fact, we know that newborn infants prefer to look at the configuration, a special configuration that looks like an upright face. So this is classic work from Johnson and Morton. So they had newborn infants hours old looking at different um, schematics and then, and then they measured how long the infants preferred to look at the schematics and they prefer to look at the one that has the characteristics of a facial configuration as opposed to one equally complex, but uh, not so. And similar Machiacassian colleagues show the same thing. So um, again, our infants hours old prefer to look at a normal face configuration than an inverted face configuration. So there seems to be something about an upright face that we 
pay more attention to. Um, but even though a phase perception is good, it's not perfect. So here's an example from Jenkins and colleagues where they got a whole bunch of pictures of lots of different people, put them together, and the job for you is to figure out how many individuals are in this display. So there's, there's repeated pictures of some of the individuals. So how many individuals are there, do you think? Three or four? The answer is two. There's the fat guy and the thin guy, okay? <laughs> so that's the fat guy, that's the fat guy, that's the thin guy, okay? The thin guy went through a period where he, lost his, where he shaved his hair. The fat guy is going in the reverse uh, order. So these four pictures, one, two, three, four, that's all the same person, right? Whereas those four are also the same person. So what this shows us is that although our face perception is pretty good, uh, it's particularly good for familiar people, right? You don't know these, these two individuals. If you did, then you'd be able to much more easily judge their changes in appearance. And we'll see uh, very, very shortly uh, where we, we've tried to use this in an experiment to measure uh, uh, our ability to do face uh, identification. Okay, so that's just a quick kind of preliminary look at, at uh, face perception in general. So what I want to do next is look at uh, issues of face ethnicity. So faces look different depending on the uh, origin of your ancestors, right? And so there are some, you know, databases now where uh, they just load lots of pictures up and then you can actually do averages based on the region of origin of the images. So this is not scientific, right? This is just images that happen to be on this particular database. Yet, if you look at where they're from, right? So the top row, we have China, Korea, Japan, Mongolia, and then Ukraine, Sweden, Poland, Russia, right? We see differences in the faces that look quite characteristic of our stereotypes about those places. And obviously, uh, for the top four Asian countries, that while there are differences between them, there are also quite a lot of similarities. Uh, uh, East Asian faces tend to have a similar overall structure, particularly in terms of the shapes of the eyes, the nose, uh, and the mouth. Whereas the four European countries you know, do, again, they're different to each other, but they also share some common characteristics. You'll also notice that the pictures look relatively attractive, right? This is actually a hallmark of averaging faces together. So when you average faces together, you don't get the average attractiveness. Overall, the average is always more attractive than the sum of the attractiveness of the individual images. And just to be equal opportunity, so here are some hunky male averages as well, right? So uh, again, in, in general, uh, average faces, they're a bit bland, but they also tend to be rated, so th th they may not be the most attractive, but relatively, uh, attractive. But similarly, again, we've got, for example, African-American, white American, Chinese, right? So across the three here, these three averages come from overlapping, but uh, not identical uh, ancestral origins. And we, we, we can see those differences as they appear in the face. So the question is, if we're identifying among individuals of each of these groups, each of these ethnicities, then uh, are we equally able to identify those individuals? And for quite a long time, we've had good psychological evidence to back up people's intuitions that it seems actually more difficult to identify people who are a different ethnicity from yourself. So here's a study from Walker and Tanaka about 20 years ago where they had Asian and Caucasian participants doing a discrimination task judging whether faces were the same or different, that were either their own race or were another race. Um, and what you can see is that the Asian participants find this task easier for Asian faces than Caucasian faces, whereas the Caucasian participants find this easier for Caucasian faces than Asian faces. So it's not that one kind of face is easy and one is hard. It's that it's in the eye of the beholder. It depends on you, it depends on your experience, it depends on your ethnicity which ones you find easy, which ones you find difficult, right? So 
Uh, and so there are many studies showing this basic pattern uh, of, of results that have led people to draw the conclusion that there is some kind of perceptual expertise for faces uh, of your own ethnicity. Now, this is not just a purely academic question, right? This has real significant lifelong influences. So just a couple of weeks ago, this was a story in the New York Times uh, of Otis Boone. Uh, Mr. Boone was 19 and was arrested for uh, aggravated uh, robbery of two white individuals in Brooklyn, New York City. Uh, he was found guilty even though he had evidence that uh, he was about two miles away at the time of at least one of the assaults. Um, and his lawyer tried to uh, uh, get the court to recognize psychological research on the cross-race uh, uh, deficit, that people are less able to correctly identify assailants uh, if they are a different ethnicity to their own. He was uh, convicted purely on the basis of eyewitness identification. So two individuals identified him on the basis of lineups that it seems in hindsight were not conducted um, uh, perfectly appropriately. Um, and so, uh, but he was sentenced to 25 years of jail. Uh, after seven years, he was able to uh, go through a second court trial. At the second trial, his lawyers successfully argued for these, uh, uh, this evidence about cross-race identification, and the jury released him apparently with five minutes uh, discussion. They immediately decided that this case was extremely weak. So, uh, uh, so specifically on the basis of the admission of this evidence about uh, deficits in other race face identification, this could be very significant uh, in courts of law. Now, before we draw conclusions that this is really due to perceptual expertise, we do have to consider other possible explanations, right? And of course, these perceptual judgments don't occur in a vacuum. They occur in a complex social universe that we live in. And in that universe, we may not treat each individual stimulus as being the same, right? And so social psychologists have done a lot of work looking at differences in the way that we characterize individuals in our own group and individuals that we perceive to be in a different group. And in this case, if you think about the uh, Walker and Tanaka study, right, they're having uh, individuals judge own race and other race faces. Maybe they attribute more or they, they use more uh, attention uh, to focus on those faces from their own ethnic group, right? So maybe they are quite capable of discriminating faces from other ethnic groups, but they choose to spend more resources on faces of their own ethnicity, and that's why they end up being better able to recognize them. So maybe this is actually a social psychological problem, not a, a kind of a, a problem of an inability of perception. And some evidence for this came from Hugenberg and colleagues where they conducted an ingenious experiment where they had people discriminate or, or learn uh, faces uh, in two different conditions, one against a red background and one against a green background. And the twist they had was that these were students at Miami University of Ohio. And so half the faces were said to uh, be student, other students at Miami University, and half the faces were from Marshall University, which is the arch enemy of Miami University. We hate Marshall University, right? Those people, they're terrible. So we immediately have an in-group, out-group situation, but they're the same faces. They're a single ethnicity, and across the experiment, they were all balanced. And when they did a similar kind of study where you have to learn some faces and then say if you've seen them before or not, what they found is that when the faces had the university labels, then the red background proved easier to identify faces on that background than faces on the green background, right? The red background being our own group, the green background being the other group. And just in case we worried that maybe faces on red backgrounds are easy to remember, once they remove the university labels and just had it as red and green, then they find no difference between them, right? So it's not to do with the color, it's to do with your judgment about what that color represents. Those people are my group. I'll spend more time to identify them uh, than people of the other group. <clears throat> 
So there may well be some social uh, influences on this phenomenon, and uh, I certainly don't want to diminish that, but the question is, is that all that's going on? Is this just a purely social psychological effect, or are there actual perceptual expertise effects that are also influencing what's going on? And so uh, uh, in a study that we did, we wanted to try and create an, an own race advantage in a situation that's a bit more realistic to our, our daily life experiences. Normally, as we go around the world, we're not simply making judgments of, yes, I know you, no, I don't know you, right? We're trying to identify people's names. We're trying to learn them over different situations. And so we conducted an experiment, and we, in this experiment, as we were setting it, setting it up, we thought, how could we get a set of uh, images of a single individual across a whole broad range of naturalistic scenes, if only there was a big database that people were posting their own pictures to, right? And then we just, and so then we thought, well, well, let's just ask people if we can download their Facebook libraries and then use those images. So that's what we did. So we got a bunch of images of women and men who were Chinese and Caucasian. And as you'll see, we got images across different sorts of uh, 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 scenes and events. We gave each of these people a name. If you know your keyboard, you'll notice that the names uh, are all the keys of the middle row of keys, so they could just respond with the name by responding on the keyboard. That made it nice and easy. And so we would have eight faces uh, of, of one quadrant. So in this case, these are the eight uh, Chinese female faces. We give each one a name, and the first thing that participants have to do is just learn these eight names, right? Learn who's Annie, who's Shirley, who's Daisy, etc. And they have to keep going until they don't make any mistakes, right? So they're incentivized to do this individuation, because if they don't, they have to spend longer and longer in the experiment. They get no more money, right? So the faster they can do it, the more efficiently they earn their reward. Um, once they've gone through the whole sequence twice without making any mistakes, we introduce new examples of the faces they've already learned, right? So you learned this was Annie, and now we introduce new images of, of Annie, right? You learned this was Shirley, and now there's new images of Shirley. And you'll notice that in the images, we simply made them grayscale, we blacked out everything that wasn't the face, but we didn't change anything else. We didn't change the size, we didn't change whether they're wearing glasses or not, right? So we kept all the variation and viewpoint that normally occurs through the world, right? Because this is, we're trying to mimic the way that you learn faces uh, in the real world. And when we did that, we found that this task was easier to learn for faces that were of your own ethnicity than faces of other ethnicities. So here are Chinese people doing our task. They find it easier to learn, so they take fewer trials to get the criterion for own race faces than other race faces. Here are our Caucasians. They also take the less time for own race than for other race. That was the first block. Then we introduced the new faces. That is more variation, so it's a little bit harder, but still the Chinese people and the Caucasian people both find it easier for their own race than for the other race. So this appears not to be simply a social psychological effect, but that actually people are finding it perceptually harder to learn these individuals uh, as they go through the, the task. So then the next question is, well, what is it about the face that they're having more difficulty for uh, if the face is other race as opposed to own race? And so um, we decided to look at differences in two different kinds of information you could learn about a face. So if you see a face, right? One way you could identify this person is to say, oh, I remember that guy's eyes. I remember the shape of the eyes. I remember exactly what they look like, okay? So you remember the component by itself, right? Another thing you could do is you could say, I remember the overall shape of the face. I remember the overall, how the pieces fit together. In other words, the overall configuration. And so we wanted to see if we get an advantage for own race faces for both the individual components of a face, and also the overall configuration. So to do that, we start with a face, and then we want to uh, get you to identify it by its components. That's pretty easy. 
we just make a jigsaw, right? We cut the face up, scramble them around. And so if you were in this part of the experiment, you studied this face, right? And then later on, 10 minutes later, we say, do you recognize this person? So the participants did not enjoy this part of the experiment very much. They found this quite difficult. Um, but if you learn that guy's eye, right, the eye's still there. You can still recognize it. And it turned out people can do this. They're not very good, but they can do it. So then we take these images and we blur them. And we blur them until we actually push people down to chance. So now, as you'll see, we've got evidence, people couldn't identify the individual from the stimulus, right? They're really guessing. We've removed all the information. You can still tell it's a face, but you can't tell whose face it is. And then we put those features back together. And then you go, oh yeah, I recognize that guy, right? So we've removed the, individual, the information from the individual components, right? Because you couldn't do the last one. So if you recognize who this is, you can't do it on the basis of the individual eye. If you identify it, you're doing it on the basis of the overall configuration. And so now what we have done is we've taken a face that an original face has both configural and component information. By scrambling it, we removed the configuration, but the component's still there. And then we blurred it to remove that component information as well. And then we put it back to the original configuration, right? So now we can compare this blurred one, which tells us about your configural knowledge, and the scrambled one, which tells us about your component knowledge. And we're interested in whether people are gonna be better able to identify own race faces for both those types of stimuli. So we do a pretty simple experiment. You learn 10 faces, and then we give you 20 uh, test stimuli that are either scrambled or blurred or both. And you just have to say, I've studied that one, or I have not studied that one before. And the measurement's something called D prime, which we don't need to go into, but basically a score of zero means you're guessing, you have no idea. And then a positive score means you've got better memory. So here's our results. Sorry, they're a little bit busy, but we'll go through them kind of one by one. So first of all, we've got that condition where we scramble and blur, and we want that to be at zero because we want you to be guessing, right? So that's a kind of a, a experiment check. And so that's these four bars, and they're all about zero. Actually, none of them are significantly different from zero. So we were successful. We did blur it enough that you were at chance. Uh, for those images. So now we're, that means we can compare scrambled and blurred. And here what you see is that for both our Hong Kong Chinese observers and our Australian observers, who are all white Australians, uh, they both show an advantage for own race faces over other race faces. And they show it both for the blurred stimuli that isolate configural information and for scrambled stimuli that identify the, uh, isolate the component information. So you, they're showing us an own race advantage, but they're showing it in both kinds of stimuli. So that means that they're generally better at, at the different sorts of information they have about a face. So their advantage doesn't seem to be isolated for one uh, type of stimulus uh, over another. Um, now, we were interested in, in uh, whether we'd find differences in the underlying brain regions responsible for processing faces. So uh, here we have, this is showing a, a ventral view uh, of, the, of a, uh, the human brain with two face-specific areas, the fusiform face area and the occipital face area, both of which uh, are activated by our faces, uh, actually activated about the same by uh, the faces of the two different e ethnicities. Um, what we were interested in was that in the occipital face area, which is early in the face uh, pathway, all three stimuli blurred, scrambled, and this time we have a whole face condition as well. They all activate the, the occipital face area, although whole faces do it the best. But as we move to the fusiform face area, we get quite strong activation from those blurred faces as well. And that kind of correlates with your intuition that the blurred faces were relatively easy to recognize um, since the fusiform face area has been um, uh, um, uh, identified as uh, a region that's uh, at least partially responsible for face identification. Um, we can also look at how you inspect those images. We probably don't have uh, too much time to go into these, but 
Um, here we have, a, a, again, another variant of this experiment where people studied either whole faces or scrambled faces. You can just kind of see the outlines of the scrambled faces there at study. And then at test, they also got either a whole face or a scrambled face. And the main thing we were interested in is whether looking at one kind of face would change your strategy of where you look on the face. So you can see our Asian participants uh, looking for an intact face kind of in the middle of the face, around the eyes and the nose at study, and then the same thing happens at test. Um, but if they see a scrambled face, they're not looking at everything in the scrambled face. They're not looking at the forehead. They're not looking at the cheeks. They're actually looking at the two eyes and the mouth. So when you see that scrambled image, people just focus on the eyes and the mouth because those are the most discriminating uh, pieces of, of information. And if that's what you study, then at test, now rather than looking in the middle of the face, you look at the eyes and the mouth, right? Because that's what you learned. So you apply that to the test stimulus. And now Caucasians showed a similar pattern. Caucasians tend to look a bit more at the eyes and the mouth anyway. And then if they study the scrambled face, they go even more simply just for the eyes and the, and the mouth. Okay, so, uh, so then th that kind of paradigm has shown us that this, uh, this pattern of face identification seems to be uh, generally better for own race than other race faces. We have another test that we can use to look at face processing, and that's the composite face effect, and that helps us to measure something called holistic face processing. So here we have a face composite, okay, of two famous African-American uh, faces. When we misalign the two components, it becomes easier to identify the top half, right? Pretty easy, Barack Obama. Do we know the bottom half? Will Smith, yes, very good, okay. If the two faces are aligned together, notice that it becomes a bit harder to separate those two individuals out. Instead, what seems to happen is you seem to have a new face there, right? That looks a little bit like each of them, but not really like either. And so if you look at, at the top half, right, this is pretty, it's pretty easy to see Barack Obama. Here, it's a little bit more difficult. So your ability to identify Barack Obama in that top half is interfered with by the bottom half. It's like the bottom half spreads up, influencing the rest of the face. And so this effect where identifying one half of the face becomes more difficult if it's paired with another part is a measure of the, the way that we seem to process a face as a whole, as a holistic unit. So we were interested in this also with own race and other race faces, but also to look at other aspects of face processing. And again, looking at differences between uh, features and uh, configurations. So here are some composites, right? Both aligned and misaligned. These are, these are different individuals, so don't worry. You're, you're not, it's not that big an effect. But uh, here we have an individual, and this one is a slightly different version of the same person, but now you can see some spacing changes between the eyes, right? We've pushed the eyes further apart. Um, and our question is going to be, how easily can you detect those spacing changes? Now, here's the misaligned face. And what we expect to see is that it's going to be a little bit easier to do this uh, uh, for the misaligned face because uh, you're not affected by that bottom half that's going to influence your judgments. Then we also introduce some um, feature changes. These are really subtle, but uh, basically we take the eyebrows and we make them a little bit darker, right? So those eyebrows are darker, those eyebrows are lighter. So our participants in this part of the experiment are just judging those eyebrow changes but we're interested in whether that's, uh, again, easier when the faces are misaligned, when you're not gonna be influenced by this irrelevant part, than when they're aligned. Um, now, to look at this, we have a few different variables going on together. And so, well, let me run over this. I don't wanna spend too long on this, um, but uh, we have, these composites, right? Now, what we're expecting is that in the misaligned composites, if you're asked to just judge the top halves, right, then you can ignore the bottom halves 
And so really your, your task is just whether, whether it's, it's we, we make the change a larger or a smaller change. But once we align the composites, we expect it's going to become more difficult if the, the irrelevant part is interfering, okay? But the, so, so what we have here is we have uh, aligned composites and misaligned composites. For each of them, we have trials that could be the same. So here the top halves are the same, uh, whereas these top halves are different. So your task would be to say, these ones are same, these ones are different. And then we also have the irrelevant information, okay? And the irrelevant information can be consistent with the top half or it can be inconsistent. So if it's consistent, then the top halves and bottom halves are congruent. So if the top halves are the same, the bottom halves are also the same. If the top halves are different, the bottom halves are also different. On the other hand, if the top halves are the same and the bottom halves are different, that's incongruent. Now, in holistic processing, where you treat, you want to focus on just part of the stimulus, but you're obliged to focus on the whole stimulus, then uh, you'll, in, in an incongruent situation, you'll get interference because the two halves that are the same will tend to look different because of that interference. Whereas in the congruent task, it should still be pretty easy because the bottom half is giving you the same signal as the top half. So then uh, in a congruent trial, the task should be relatively easy. Okay, so to, what that means is that here we have some different graphs, okay? So here are our own race Caucasian observers for the spacing changes. What we expect to see under holistic processing is that the misaligned trials, there's not much difference between congruent and incongruent. For the aligned trials, there is a difference. And so we expect to see kind of like a, a, a greater than shape. And the take home message is that in this experiment, both our Caucasian observers and our Chinese observers for both own race and, uh, and other race composites show largely the same effect, okay? They show largely a large congruency effect for aligned uh, composites and not much of an effect for misaligned composites. What we were interested in was whether this effect would be larger for own race and other race faces, but it does not seem to be larger for own race and other race faces. In fact, it seems to be uh, about the same. That was for those spacing changes, whether the eyes were closer or further apart. Uh, this is for the feature changes, whether the eyebrows were lighter or darker. Now notice that this is simply a brightness judgment. This is simply, are these, uh, are the single feature lighter or darker in the two stimuli? So you might think that it shouldn't really be affected by what the bottom half of the face was doing. But in fact, we still get strong congruency judgments. So this is still easier to do uh, if uh, in a holistic uh, uh, processing situation, if the irrelevant information is, is consistent with your judgment, then if it's inconsistent. But again, we're not seeing any difference in the size of the uh, composite effect between our own race faces and our other race faces. So that's evidence that holistic processing is also about equally strong between uh, own race and other race face processing. Okay, so then to summarize our ethnicity effects, what we've seen uh, is that own race faces do seem to be perceptually easier to discriminate and learn than other race faces. And this difference seems to occur across a broad range of types of information that we know are important for identifying faces. So across component and configuration uh, channels and also uh, with holistic processing. And so it seems that this uh, uh, increased ability to identify own race faces as opposed to other race faces seems to be uh, a general uh, benefit rather than isolated to a particular form of uh, facial information. Okay, so let's move to the second, or the, the last part of the talk. Rather than looking at face ethnicity, thinking about another sort of complex information about faces, and this is face personality. So when, when I show you this face, depending on your political leanings or whatever, you will draw different uh, attributes about the personality uh, of the face, whether those are valence positive or valence negative. 
Um, but of course, you know this individual, right? So maybe your judgments are based on your existing knowledge of the individual. So that doesn't necessarily tell us anything particularly interesting about face perception per se. Um, but what is interesting to us, right, is that we draw uh, judgments about personality very easily. And so the Mona Lisa, one of the reasons the Mona Lisa is so captivating as a work of art is because, you know, for 500 years, none of us have known really what's going on behind that face, right? Is she happy? She looks happy, but does she really look happy? Not really, right? So there's something complicated going on and we kind of naturally want to interpret that. So let's, we can kind of instantiate that again. So here are three people you've never met, right? So let's say that you had to vote for them, maybe you know, for head of department or for city council or for president, right? So if you're voting, who are you gonna vote for? You're gonna vote for the one on the left, the one in the middle, or the one on the right? So who thinks left? No, middle? Some, right? Okay, I will judge about 65% for the right, about 35% for the middle, 0% for this guy, right? So, of course, these people don't exist. They're computer-generated images, and they vary in terms of a property called competence, right? So competence is if you just ask someone uh, do you think this person essentially knows what they're doing and is capable of doing it? Then they say, yes, this face looks like it does and that face looks like it doesn't. Now, the, the property of competence is not a physical property, right? It's not actually marked physically on a face like age is, like emotion is, even like identity is. Um, yet, People are quite reliable at judging whether faces appear competent or not. Um, uh, and as we'll see, or as we just saw, it influences our decisions. So who is to say that that guy is not the best president that we could all have, right? Actually, none of us know, but none of us would vote for him. Um, now, it turns out that these properties do not seem to be related to people's actual uh, abilities. So Fortune 500 companies uh, more than average tend to have competent and dominant looking CEOs, even though the companies that have those CEOs do not outperform other companies, right? So these competent CEOs don't actually seem to be more competent, but they, those individuals seem to be more likely to get into that position if they have those facial characteristics. In some seminal work from Alex Todorov and his colleagues, they show that these, there does seem to be influence between these uh, capabilities and actual real world behavior. So they looked at across a, a range of uh, US elections. They took candidates in the elections and they looked at judgments of facial competence, right? So they just asked people, how competent do these individuals look? People who did not know who the individuals were, right? So. They're just judging the, the appearance, not their actual you know, political uh, uh, policies and so forth. And then they looked at the difference in the actual votes that the candidates got in the election. And what you can see here is uh, a fairly significant uh, positive correlation, right? So candidates who were, had more, uh, were judged to be more competent based on their face than their opponent tended to get more votes than their opponent, right? So they tended to get elected because uh, of their face. Now, of course, it's not quite as easy uh, uh, as that. In particular, they tend to get stronger effects uh, of facial competence among low information voters than high information voters. So voters that actually know about the policies of the, of the individuals tend to vote for the policies. But of course, as we know, many voters are low information voters who do not actually know much about the people they're voting for, and they will tend to be influenced by these characteristics. So we were interested to uh, see whether you know, this would occur uh, in a uh, small South Pacific democracy. So we did the similar experiment in New Zealand with four politicians who were relatively unknown, but maybe some of you now know uh, my Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, because obviously after the tragedy in Christchurch a couple of weeks ago, 
She has become more uh, uh, well-known internationally than before. Um, but uh, so when we, when we did this study, this was uh, uh, an election uh, a few years ago. And so we were interested to assess candidates uh, across uh, this election in, in New Zealand. We gave their photos to Americans who had no idea who these people were. Um, and of course, as you saw from that first schematic of the, the photos from the different countries, right? Individuals, even in the same kind of ethnic group, depending on how we define that, can look quite different. So you know, New Zealand people tend to look different than Americans. Um, yet, uh, uh, we thought you know, we'll, we'll get the Americans to uh, judge the competence of these individuals along with some other um, characteristics like attractiveness, likability, and trustworthiness. Uh, and so we didn't really know how valid these attributions would be. Maybe Americans can't tell the competence of a, uh, of a New Zealand face. Um, and then we went through, so there's two major parties, a kind of a center left and a center right party in New Zealand. So we looked at those two candidates across every electorate and then looked at the vote share uh, across the election. And basically what we found is that while there were some positive associations uh, across a number of the uh, uh, of the attributes we looked at, competence was the one that um, uh, in a logistic regression where when um, partialing out the influences of the, of the other uh, variables, competence was the one that was statistically a, a statistically significant predictor. And such that um, uh, in an electorate of about 30,000 people, which is about the size of a New Zealand electorate, the influence of competence between a candidate who looked maximally competent and one who looked very incompetent was worth about 3,000 votes. And so that is reliably uh, the size uh, of the difference between two candidates in an election. So having a competent face could be quite significant uh, if you were uh, uh, standing uh, in the election. Um, the final then study I'll, I'll talk about before we finish is we wanted to, to go further than that to say, well, are people really inferring these attributes from the face or do they directly perceive them? Like, do they perceive them in the same way they perceive other facial attributes? And to do this, we use a visual after effect, okay? So in a visual after effect, so here's a tilt after effect. To do this, I would ask you to adapt to a stimulus like some tilted lines for a long period of time. And then if I, after doing that, if I showed you vertical lines, you would see them not as vertical, but you'd see them actually tilted in the other direction, okay? So these after effects tend to give you an opposing effect. So if you spend time adapting to one thing, then you end up seeing it a different way. Now, I can quickly show you or induce another kind of a after effect here. Um, so this is probably, may not be big enough, but anyway, if you stare in the middle at the plus sign, just keep staring, don't move your eyes. What should tend to come out? We'll do this one more time. Now keep staring. Importantly, when, you, when this time when the Buddha comes, turn and look at the person next to you. Okay, so note that the after effect you should have got was an expansion after effect, right? Because the, the pattern is going in, and so your visual system gets used to the inness, and then when you see a normal face, you perceive it as expanding, right? So you perceive it going in the opposite direction. So we can do the same thing with facial attributes, okay? So what we'll do is we'll do an, an after effect experiment where you adapt to a face that is highly competent, and then we show you a face that is only moderately competent, right? At least these people are not low in competence. So the question is, is your judgment of the competence of these individuals gonna be influenced by the adaptation you've done to another individual who has a varying level of competence? So we have three different um, traits. We have competence, we have trustworthiness, and we have warmth and we have individuals who are high on each, right? So these people are very competent, these are very trustworthy, these are very warm, 
We have low competence, not trustworthy, cold, and then the test stimuli are the ones who are moderately, they're in the middle, okay? So you adapt to one or other, high or low, and then we test you in the middle. So the question is, your judgments of the ones in the middle should be about average, but are they gonna be influenced by the direction of the one you just saw? If you just saw one that's highly competent, we expect that your judgments of these ones should be lower, right? Because you should be pushed in the other direction. If you're kind of directly perceiving personality from the face, then this is what we expect, and that's what we found. So the red bars are where you adapt high, so you see a face that's highly competent, then the average face seems less competent. If you adapt it to one that's low competence, then it seems like it's more competent, right? So what this suggests to us is that people are not making elaborate cognitive constructions of these personality traits. They're judging the physical features of the face, and just like at the start of the talk, uh, they're going way beyond the data uh, of the face to make these quite sophisticated judgments about them. And of course, that is then affecting things like attributions about uh, whether they should vote for them and, and so forth. So to conclude, uh, face perception goes far beyond our judgments of simple attributes like identity, age, and emotion. We show benefits of expertise for recognizing faces of our own ethnicity. And we also make snap judgments about faces uh, based on these quite complicated um, uh, variables that, again, I need to stress, we have no evidence actually infer reliably about individuals. The fact that you have a competent face does not infer that you yourself are more competent, yet it seems that people will make judgments about you uh, that they assume you are more competent. And you can see how that can lead certain individuals to then get in positions where they have more opportunity than others because of those attributions. So we need to understand these sorts of uh, phenomena because they underpin these other, as, as I said at the beginning, more complex uh, aspects about uh, social psychology and you know, judgments about individuals, uh, sociological uh, uh, effects you know, that are much more sophisticated and have profound influences for us all. Okay, so thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions that you have.